rise today uh, to honor Tyree Nichols. Georgia lawmakers hold a moment of silence to remember the 29-year-old Memphis man whose death sparked peaceful protests in Atlanta over the weekend. Good evening and welcome to Lawmakers. On this ninth day for the Georgia legislative session, I'm Donna Lowry in Atlanta. We'll have more reactions from lawmakers to the death of Tyree Nichols coming up in our Capitol report. Also on the show, two legislators offering differing views on how to handle crime. One has a bill to impose 10-year mandatory sentences to those who commit or attempt to commit violent crimes. Another is renewing calls for gun reform in light of the continuing mass shootings across the country. We'll have someone on to look at the crisis of affordable housing in Georgia. And a lawmaker joins us to discuss increasing the cap on the tax credit scholarship program that helps private schools. But right now, let's get down to the Capitol where our Rochelle Ritchie is standing by. Hi, Rochelle. Hi, Donna. Well, like much of the country today, the House paused to remember the life of 29-year-old Tyree Nichols, who was senselessly killed by five Memphis police officers who are now all charged with murder. His death has now led to the Georgia House saying that it's time for Georgia to look at, to look at its own policing tactics and training. A moment of silence for Tyree Nichols. Arise today uh, to honor Tyree Nichols. A son, father, avid skateboard enthusiast, a friend, and more importantly, a man. The 29 year old father and son killed just yards away from his mother's home in Memphis, Tennessee. His brutal death caught on police body cam, causing outrage to both those on the left and right. It's an embarrassment to, to law enforcement professionals, and uh, you know I don't I don't know how it happens, but but it does. But you know there are millions of law enforcement officers in this country, and every three or four months we see an incident like that that gets national attention and gives everybody a bad name. This weekend, Governor Brian Kemp took to Twitter to share his thoughts, saying, "Quote: Marty, the girls, and I were truly shaken and saddened by the footage of events that led to Tyree Nichols' tragic death." We are praying for his family and community during this time of heartbreak. As citizens express their grief and reactions to his killing, the state continues to respect the right of peaceful protest. This morning in the House, all members rose to honor Nichols' memory. And while horrific events leading up to his death happened in another state, Minority Leader James Beverly says it is imperative that Georgia legislators do more to protect its citizens. The Georgia House of Representatives will not stand idly by while injustice prevails. So I'm calling on this House, the Georgia House of Representatives in general, and the Georgia House Democratic Caucus specifically, to hold hearings to pass legislation so that this tragedy does not come to our state. Beverly did not elaborate on the House floor what that legislation could look like, but Republican Chairman Bill Hitchens, who served in law enforcement for 43 years, believes Georgia can do more to ensure proper training, but there are some things that may be tough to mandate. Can you say what you think that legislation might look like? I have no idea, but I don't know how you legislate emotions. And most, and I don't know what happened, what transpired before, to, but I saw the part where they grabbed him and pulled him out of the car without, uh, without any, I have no idea what that was all about. I mean, uh, it's, it, it didn't appear to me to be a normal traffic stop. Other lawmakers say more state oversight of municipal police departments could be one prevention method. Here under the Gold Dome, we have the ability to regulate state law enforcement much better than municipal and county law enforcement. But I do think we need to look and make sure that our local law enforcement officers are, that we're not lowering the standards, that we are keeping the, the bar for hiring much higher. Um, as I said before, with the way POST takes certifications away from officers at a record rate here in the state of Georgia, I think that's positive. But it's also a little concerning that is it the possibility of some people getting through into the job and then once they get in there they don't do it well enough and lose that certification. I do think we always need to go back and check and make sure that we're not making it easy for people to become cops in the state of Georgia. 
And Donna, some lighter news from the House. They applauded the return of the PAGE program, inspiring the Senate to do the same. There was a release by Senator Blake Tillery calling for students ages 12 and up to apply for its program. That is my Capitol Report. Donna, back to you. We love the pages. Thank you so much, Rochelle. We're going to devote time now to bills dealing with crime from two different approaches. Joining me are Republican Senator Brandon Beach of Alpharetta. He's chair of the Senate Economic Development and Tourism Committee, too. Also here is Democratic Representative Michelle Au of Johns Creek. And so I want to thank you for both being on Lawmakers. And Chairman thank Beach, you. I'm going to start with you. Thank you. Let's for start me. with your Senate Bill 7, and uh, which I understand is also called the uh, three G's bill, gangs, guns, guns gone. Um, Tell us what well, it's all about. Let me just say this. The, the, the role of government is to keep its citizens safe. And right now, people don't feel safe. You've got a, homicides up in third year in a row in Atlanta in Sunday's paper, 170 homicides uh, this year. And we've got to get tough on crime. If you listen to Governor Kemp's speech, State of the State, he spent a good portion of it on crime and uh, gang crime, violent crime, and backing the law enforcement. We've made it a caucus priority. Our Lieutenant Governor, Bird Jones, has made it a top priority of his to fight crime. This bill, what it does, and I got this idea actually from Fulton County Judge Craig Schwal. He and I were having lunch and he told me there's a revolving door and we've got to get tough on these violent crimes. So basically what this does is if you go into a convenience store and rob somebody at gunpoint, before you serve a day of that armed robbery sentence, you have a pre-enhanced 10-year mandatory sentence uh, that cannot be changed by a DA or a Superior Court judge. It's a 10-year mandatory sentence, and we're going to get tough on, on violent crime. So 10-year minimum without, and, and no, um, no ability for pardon or parole or early release? No, none. And we've got to get that message. I would say what we need to do after we pass this, we have to have some kind of pr public service announcements to go out to these young folks. Because when you look at these murders that happened this year, 19 of them were teenagers. We're losing our youth. We need to tell our youth that if you're going to commit a crime at gunpoint, there are consequences, and you're going to go to jail for 10 years, mandatory minimum sentence, and no DA or judge is going to be able to help you. So you better think twice before you commit a crime at gunpoint. Okay, so I'm going back and forth because you have a different bill, but I wanted to get your reaction before we move on. So I do agree with Senator Beach that the role of government is to keep people safe. And I don't see how you can have this conversation about violent crime, which we all care about and which we're all concerned about, without addressing the role of gun violence in that violent crime. And I think that... Um, I wish sometimes that our colleagues across the aisle would attack with as much vigor prevention of this type of violent crime as they do prosecuting the crime after the fact. My bills have to do with gun safety, and this takes place in the setting of a state with some of the most lax gun laws in the country, right? This is in the setting of having passed SB 319, which is the permitless carry law, which enables people to, without a background check, carry loaded guns in public. Um, there are several ways to address having um, increases in violent crime that does involve guns, as Senator Beach noted. Three of the bills that I am introducing that have to do with common sense gun safety have to do with extending background checks to cover private gun sales and transfers, which include almost 40 percent of gun sales that are not through a federally licensed gun dealer and do not have to pass through a, a background check in order for someone to take a gun home. Second um, bill has to do with introducing a three-day waiting period, which can build in a cooling-off period to diffuse these kinds of crimes of impulse or passion that can lead to interpersonal violence, domestic violence, and most prominently, suicide as a, as a result. And the third bill has to do with something else that, Dr. <laughs> that Senator Beach touched on, which is um, guns in the hands of adolescents and children, right? And this is a safe storage law that I'm going to drop later this week, either tomorrow or the next day that prohibits people who have guns from allowing them to be accessed by minors. Sounds like they're similar to the federal legislation. Is, the, is that what you're going for? Well, especially with the universal background check, it aims to close a loophole in federal legislation. Current federal legislation requires background checks for guns that are purchased through federally licensed uh, firearms dealers. However, private gun sales and transfers, uh, which are making up an uh, increasing number 
increasing percentage of gun sales do not have to undergo this background check process. And that's an increasingly large loophole, particularly in the setting of a state that has removed one more safety net from having people required to go through a background check in order to carry loaded guns in public. Yeah. So I think we're after the same thing. I think that uh, Senator Beach is absolutely right that we're all very concerned about violence uh, in our streets. We're concerned about our children. And these are two ways coming from two different angles to address these issues. And I hope that we can work together to address the uh, preemptive, preventative aspects of violent crime. Uh, as well as some of the bills that he is introducing. You voted in favor of the permitless carry bill, though, right? Correct. And I'm, I'm pro-Second Amendment. But, but these individuals that are committing these crimes are violent people, and they need to be punished so, and that's why it's a mandatory sentence. So a mandatory sentence would mean locking them up for a long time. It puts a lot on the criminal justice system, the corrections, the whole bit. Anything in the works to help with that part of well, it? Our previous gov right governor, now. Governor Deal, we worked on criminal justice reform, but those were nonviolent criminals. And I'm okay with rehabilitating those folks. These folks that are committing crimes that are violent and putting guns to people's head uh, when they carjack them or when they rob a gr uh, convenience store, um, they need to go and, and pay the consequences. And that's what this does. And Judge Schwal told me it's a revolving door down at Fulton County. And I've heard it from the police officers too, law enforcement. It's the same folks they keep arresting. So we've got to get tough on, on these violent, what I call seven deadly sins, uh, violent crimes, and, and let them know there's going to be consequences. So the seven deadly sins law isn't enough? No, I mean, I think that's what we need to do, and that's what SB 7 does. Okay. It addresses those violent felony crimes with a gun. Okay. Let's talk about the, the, the district attorney's aspect to all of this. It kind of takes it out of their hands, the ability to make negotiations when it comes to sentencing. And, and I, I think we need to take it out of their hands on these violent criminals. And it's, uh, we've got to do something about this crime. It's out of control. And look, we have a, a big economic engine in our city called the World Congress Center. And the convention business is a very competitive business. And if we want to continue to have conventions, Super Bowls, and college football championships, we've got to be known as a safe city. And right now, we are not seen that way. We are seen as a higher murder cap per capita than Chicago. That's not good. And we've got to get that under control. And the only way you're going to do that is with tougher penalties. And let these young kids that are committing these crimes know that there are going to be serious consequences if you commit a crime with a gun. Yeah. Give, I want to, I want to turn to you. But given what you, you were here when the, the bill passed, mm -hmm. permitless carry, and it passed overwhelmingly with the, the Republicans, do you see your bills getting anywhere this legislative session? Well, I have to say that gun safety legislation is being tough on crime, right? So let's talk about universal background checks for a second. What universal background checks does is that it precludes people who have a criminal history, people who are convicted felons, this revolving door that you talk about, people who have committed, committed violent crimes in the past. It precludes these types of people from getting access to guns, which I think we can all agree is, is a good goal to have if we want to cut down on violent crime. The other way that I think it addresses some of the shared um, concerns and priorities that we have is that permitless carry, when we have these giant loopholes and um, inability to background check people, it actually makes it a less safe environment for our law enforcement, right? So I know we all support um, keeping law enforcement safe as they go about doing their jobs and keeping the rest of us safe. So a lot of gun safety regulation does have to do with addressing violent crime, preempting violent crime, and addressing the problems where the root are. Explain the, the bill that deals with the locking up the guns a little better. Yeah. So the number one cause of death in children and adolescents in this country is actually gun violence, right? This is a statistic that we don't get to ignore, we don't get to turn away from, and that is what this uh, safe storage bill deals with, right? It is what I view as a pediatric health bill. And what it does is it simply requires that any gun in a home or outside your home that can be accessed by a minor is stored securely, separate from its ammunition, with either a trigger lock or in a safe or any number of ways that are readily accessible and readily available and not that expensive in order to keep these weapons safe and away from the hands of children and adolescents who might use them unsafely, right? Mm -hmm. It seems like common sense just the same way that we require 
children to be in car seats, right? That we require certain types of um, you know locks on or fences around pools. It's it's really a pediatric health bill, and it deals with what we cannot avoid seeing as the number one cause of death in children and teenagers. And Chairman Beach, your thoughts on the, on on that bill in particular? Well, I mean, I, I think a lot of it goes back to the parents. I mean, I know when we raised our children, my wife and I both had guns. We kept them up on the top shelf in the closet to where the gun the the children could not get to them. Um, so I think a lot of it is common sense, and we've got to just uh, have have the parents involved and, and let them know that they got to, you know, take care of their guns. But do we need a law to maybe make sure some parents have that common sense? I don't know that you need a law for parents to parent, but that's just my thoughts. Yeah. You feel that that's something that, that should happen. Well, I, I think that when you see that statistic and you read it, you can't move on from that, right? You can't say that it's the number one cause of death in children and teens and be like, well, Nothing to do about it. We have to, it is our moral obligation as leaders to look at some solutions that may make sense. And it may be yeah. something that you're doing anyway, right? Like maybe I would be putting my kid in a car seat anyway because I know it's a safer way to drive with them, right? But sometimes there are common sense things that need to be um, codified into law to make sure that everyone is doing the safest possible things, especially when children are involved. So you don't think it should be codified in the law? Well, I, I really don't. I think the parents should be involved in that. Um, and I think when you're looking at some of these teenagers that have guns, they're breaking in cars at Colony Square and Atlantic Station. They're not stealing laptops. They're just going in there to steal one thing, guns. And, and that's what's happening. And these guns that they're committing crimes with are not their parents' guns or their guns. They're stolen guns. So that's the number one uh, stolen item out of car break-ins is guns. Okay. Well, we're going to keep an eye on both of your okay. bills and report bags. Thank you both for coming on. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for having us. Coming up, if you've looked for a house or apartment lately, you've noticed what some are calling a housing crisis. Also, a move to increase the cap on the education tax credit when we come back. Lawmakers is made possible by Georgia Farm Bureau. With over 80 years of helping everyone understand the importance of agriculture in our state, after all, ag is Georgia's number one industry. Food and fiber production represents over 74 billion in output of Georgia's strong economy. The Georgia Farm Bureau legislative team works to represent producers across Georgia at the state capitol during the session and year round. Georgia Farm Bureau, the voice of Georgia farmers. Here's what's new this month with Passport. You make a good team. As long as we're together, it's perfect. Seems to come through. Hey, lad. Seems to do. Something deeply dangerous is happening here. This is just beginning. These and all your favorite shows are available with Passport. Support your PBS station and stream more with Passport on the PBS app. My heart is racing right now. <laughs> Fasten your seatbelt. This season we have 21 incredible guests. It's wild. It's really something. And there are so many highlights. I feel like a time traveler. You're uncovering the truth. These are consequential things. Yeah. <laughs> Mind blown. What do you have? Spies working for you? How did you find this? Oh, look at everybody. You have a DNA cousin. I wish my mom could be here to see this. What? That's very moving, actually. Mm. <laughs> no. Your ancestors came no, on the I'm main. Made you. I've got history. I feel the presence of, you know, of all these people. What a treasure. Those are some of the incredible stories of the new season of Finding Your Roots. Tuesday on GPB. Welcome back to Lawmakers. I'm Donna Lowry. We're going to look at aspects of housing and education, two topics that have become priorities so far in this legislative session. Joining me now are Democratic Representative Deborah Bazemore of South Fulton 
and Republican Representative John Carson of Marietta. He's also chairman of the House Retirement Committee. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Donna. Thank You're you. each here to talk about two different topics, so yes. I'm not ignoring the each of you. I go back <laughs> and forth, okay? So we're going to start with, start with you, Representative Babe Moore. Sure. You were on the House Committee on Regulation, Affordability, and Access. Actually, here it is right here. This is the, the summary of this report that you guys did looking at things. Tell me what what you heard from people. So there were so many variables to this issue and so many concerns that were brought up. Um, initially, we had uh, four members of the House that were on. We had someone from the real estate. Um, he was professional and a county commissioner. So we had a variety of people. But the concerns that I had was that we were told there are not enough units, meaning houses, for everybody in Georgia. And we continue to grow and grow, and businesses continue to come, and they need housing for those individuals. Yeah, one of the things I learned is that Georgia has one of the worst rates when it comes to housing, that that in the, 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 the nation has a problem. Yes. But Georgia has a problem, and it's only been, it's been getting worse, it right? Has. And we're not talking about single family units necessarily, mm -hmm. or apartments, we're talking about everything. Everything. What kind of, what are you hearing from your constituents in terms of when they try to get on a, something to live in? So, so one of the issues that we found too, and that I know in my district, um, my constituents have had experience of, is that we have investors that come from out of state and they are buying up these homes. So they're taking them off the market. So people that want to buy a home, they're not available or the prices are going sky high and they can't afford it. Right now, the medium cost for our home is $300,000. And with us having, not even having $15 an hour um, minimum, it's difficult for people to purchase. This is a American dream to own your own home. Yeah, I'm gonna get back with you in a second, but I don't wanna ignore you, Chairman Carson, a little bit. Let's talk about what you're here. You're the lead sure. sponsor of HB 54, which deals with <clears throat> the uh, increasing the cap on the tax credit scholarship. So. First, you need to explain that because they've been around for a while, but people may not understand what they exact well, what they are exactly. Thank you again, and thank you for having me. And real quick, I want to do say I do want to say uh, happy birthday to my mother. I mentioned I this. I told you that you could I say that. I mentioned this backstage. Yes, um, happy birthday, mom. She's going to turn 85 next month. She lives in Warner Robins. Wonderful. And she's still going strong. So happy birthday to her. I'm glad yes. you got that out. Okay. Thank you very much. She's proud of you right now. I'm telling you. Well, I hope so. I hope she's <laughs> tuned in. Um, sure, this is the Qualified Education Expense Tax Credit. Uh, some people call this the Georgia Goal Credit because they're the most popular scholarship organization. Uh, the current uh, cap on the program is $120 million, and effectively how it works, many of your viewers already know, is that you subscribe to this program and say, I'll contribute $1,000, and you get approved from the Department of Revenue for that $1,000. And then you write a check, and your, your check clears, and then you get to take that $1,000 off your taxes that are due the next year. Uh, effectively, taxpayers are choosing to prepay their taxes. The cap on this program is $120 million, and what these scholarship organizations do is they hand out scholarships to individuals. The, by far, the majority of the students are from public schools, and they are able to go to private schools instead. Uh, the cap on this program, uh, like I said, is $120 million. We're looking to go up to $200 million. And the reason being is because on day one, back on January 3rd, several weeks ago, Georgia taxpayers applied for over $150 million worth of credits. Mm -hmm. And that's money going into it. So it's oversubscribed right now. We're looking to increase this up to $200 million. Okay. Uh, you sent us a graphic that we're going to put up now. Yes. I want you to explain the difference between this and the money that goes into QBE, which is the, the quality basic education That's right. formula for how education is uh, you know, paid for in this state. Sure. So if we can have that graphic up. Yeah. Basically, in, in Georgia, we have a quality basic education mandate. And it basically says we're going to fund schools at a certain amount. Well, you can see uh, on, the, on your screen, your viewers can see that every single year in the blue, you can see the average scholarship under this program is far less than the QBE state funding. These are both per student numbers. Anywhere from $1,000 to, to $1,400, $1,500 less the state is spending to give a tax credit scholarship 
to a private school than we're spending in state funding for the public schools. When we have this program, the, the Georgia high school graduation rate per Department of Education as of October last year was 84%. Donna, the graduation rate from the Georgia Gold Program, 99%. So it's working. People it's obviously working. popular. Absolutely. And so many people are applying and on wait lists for these scholarships. There are those who are critics who say this is like a voucher program. What do you say? It's not a voucher program. It's a tax credit program. And these same people are going to attack it in many different ways. What this is doing is providing choice to parents. I would also say that uh, it's also been attacked for uh, various uh, false premises and so forth. There are two-thirds of the scholarships that are handed out by the, uh, these scholarship organizations go to families making less than $46,000 a year mm -hmm. based on uh, adjusted for family size. In addition, Georgia is about one-third uh, citizens of color. The scholarships under this program go to 48% families of color. Okay. We're going to switch back to affordable housing. And I know one of the studies committee's findings had to do with county and city governments and how they feel about this. Mm -hmm. And are you looking at legislation that will, uh, will, will make sure that the county and city governments deal with their zoning and all of those kinds of things? Thank you for asking that because that was one of the big issues that was presented by the presenters. My concern with that, if we as state legislators make those changes, some of them have to be a constitutional change, um, state change, local change, but we are taking away from the local municipalities and elected officials their power to dictate what goes on in their district, their area, because they're close to the people. And I know we talked about the building materials, we talked about the zoning, we talked about regulations across the board. So that's a concern. Um, I think we need to leave some of those things to the individuals that are right there, close to the people, and knowing what works in one's community and one's county. It sounds like no easy answers, no bills right now. Nothing has been dropped on this. Exactly, no bills right now. There are some in the works. Um, and I, I truly wanted to thank um, Chairman Dale Washburn because he was the chair of this committee and I truly believe that he has a heart for a bipartisan bill. And so we are still having discussions even though the study committee is over. Um, it was over in De uh, November. And so, but we are still having conversations. So I really appreciate the fact that he knows that he has to represent, we have to represent the entire state of Georgia and all its constituents. Right, and we, didn't, we don't even have time to get into the rural areas and all. You feel pretty good that something will be done this year? I do. Okay, what about with your bill? How are you feeling that this, the raising this cap? Because 120 million to 200 million is quite a jump. It is quite a jump, but uh, I, I think we're gonna make significant progress here. Uh, you may have seen the press release where Speaker Burns spoke in favor of uh, taking up this measure. I've uh, received uh, fee feedback from, positive feedback from other powerful leaders uh, at the Capitol. So I'm looking forward to this. You know, Donna, if we can give parents more choice mm. with greatly increased student achievement, with more diversity, at lower cost to the taxpayers, that's a win for everyone. Why would we not do this? This program is turning around kids' lives. There's no reason to slow it down. Remind me of when it started. Has it been three years? It's a the, little more than that, though. I well, the original right. legislation was introduced by my friend Earl Earhart in 2008. 2008. So it's and, been around that long. I oh, yes. covered it as an education reporter. So. Absolutely. I, I will say, uh, I just, if I could say something for about uh, just a few minutes, uh, just a few seconds, there is a, there's a young man that I was just heard the story of. His name is Riley. And um, about five years ago, when he was in seventh grade, his father passed away. His mother obviously became a single parent. He was struggling in school, C's and D's. He was in a, a public school, uh, just barely getting by, in conduct problems and so forth. He got a scholarship to uh, a different school, turned his life around. He's getting all A's, maybe a few B's. Just a couple of months ago, uh, he, in, in addition, he has no conduct issues. And a couple of months ago, he just accepted uh, 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 
just accepted into Georgia Tech. Oh, so wow. That just okay. turned his life around because okay. of this program. Okay, we're running out of time. Thank you so much for both of you being here. Thank and that does it for Lawmakers Today. We'll be back tomorrow for Legislative Day 10. Goodbye. Thank you.